Good morning, Lighthouse Church. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's a beautiful day out today. Which is not out, so I'm going to be gone. I did. Getting a little feedback. You can't hear me? Testing, testing, testing. How's this better? Not better. That's good. I can hear you. Yeah, you can hear me. How are we doing, John? Good? All right. Well, anyways, to uh, our church family, we say welcome home to those who are visiting us, uh, either with us this morning or on Facebook or YouTube. We say welcome to our home. We prepared for this, uh, for you to be here today, um, and we, uh, we celebrate this gathering, this ecclesia of the church. Um, by way of announcements, um, Karen Benson asked me to just give a shout out of thanks to all of those who helped her pack up this past week and move some of her stuff from her home. She's preparing to sell. And uh, she also is asking if there's anyone this week, any time this week, from Monday on through the weekend, who can help her with her, her garage sale, setting it up, and then the sale itself will be uh, between Friday and Monday. And she said any time between 10 and 4. So we're going to haul some tables over to her place today so that she can have those to set up and have a place to put some of the things in. So if there's anyone that can lend some help to Karen, she would be greatly appreciative and said she'd be delighted to even make a donation to the church for whoever would come and, and lend support. Um, also, by way of announcements, uh, you'll see out on the table out there this kind of map. It's sort of a circuitous route. Hopefully you can follow it. It comes off from, what is it, MapQuest or something. And it's to our house. Sue and I are hosting uh, a cookout this Friday at 6 o'clock. It's sort of like our soup supper, except that we're going to put things on the grill. I know there's going to be hot dogs and hamburgers and maybe some brats. And I think we're going to try to make some uh, fresh uh, uh, fried french fries. And so you're all welcome. We're going to hopefully we'll have some people who will bring some musical instruments along, maybe a harmonica, I think, and a guitar. And, I think no, ukulele, no I heard, maybe there might be a ukulele. Anyways, we're hoping it can be uh, something that would be just a joyous attendance. We're right on the lake, so we should have some nice weather. Looking forward in the, uh, on the computer this week, I think it's going to be sunny and warm, and so you're all welcome. Um, the other announcement here, uh, there's a Red Cross, and these announcements you'll also find out on the table in the entrance. There's a Red Cross blood drive scheduled September 26th between 2 and 5 p.m. in Cedarville at the community center. The address is on here, and there's a phone number uh, if you would choose to make an appointment. Uh, we've been praying for Violet Stacy because she um, had uh, some recent problems with severe anemia. She's required several blood transfusions, and, and she's only nine years old, but that's a ra raised in her own awareness the need for blood. So her request is please donate blood to the American Red Cross. You know, even though she may not be the personal recipient, she knows the importance of blood and blood products because of this uh, medical condition that she's struggling with right now. So we want to continue to raise her in our prayers. And if anybody could, write these dates down or post this on your calendar and keep that date in mind. Um, I think that pretty much takes care of it. As far as announcements are concerned, so let us begin our time of worship by raising our voices in praise.
just be winning. Yeah, I don't know what you're saying. Ta-da! They put a capo on it. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, folks. Grace, Grace. Consume me from the inside out. 
I'm not Pastor Scott. I'm Kirk Tyler, one of the elders in the church here. And uh, Scott asked because he had a lot of traveling pat this past weekend, this next week, whether I'd stand in for him. So he, he sits here among us this morning, but I uh, I took the, the time and perhaps the liberty to prepare a message. It's going to be a little different because we're going to do what's called an expository message today, which means we're going to open up the scripture together, we're going to read it together, and we're going to kind of touch on it. And uh, it's going to be something other than just, you know, a topical kind of thing. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today from uh, the book of Galatians. And if you want to, you can open your Bibles to page 247, the ones that are on the table there. And we won't word it, read it necessarily word for word, but we're going to kind of out lead you through. We'll be sort of hopping from point to point. And it's 147. I'm sorry. 147? All right, 147. I'm staying corrected. Anyways, uh, Galatians is the book. Uh, it's been said that uh, the book of Galatians is uh, Paul's declaration of independence from the law. Some people have uh, named it the Magna Carta of Christian liberty. Uh, Martin Luther said it was his Catherine von Bora, which uh, was the name of his wife, because he said he was married to it. Uh, and he said that uh, the book of Galatians is actually the short version of a larger uh, exposition that he did in the, for the book of Romans. Now, every uh, story, you know, we need to get a little, into a little backstory of this to, to let you know who this is to and why he's writing it and so forth. Every back, or every story has a backstory. It's been said that if you read a text without a context, it's a pretext, which means it's an assumption. Okay, we want to assume anything, so we want to look back a little bit 
to the events that led up to this. And, you know, every story has a beginning. And for me, and I think probably even though these words weren't penned at the time that Paul wrote this letter, this is the very first letter that he wrote uh, of all of the epistles that he wrote. You know, Paul wrote 14 books of the new, of the 27 books of the New Testament. So he's, you know, he's written a lot. But this was the first letter that he wrote. And so every story has a, has a beginning, has a backstory. And I want to begin this beginning of the backstory with the words, literally, that were written by John in his first chapter of the Gospel of John. He said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God from the very beginning. He said, through him all things were created. Without him nothing was created that ever has been created. In him there was life, and his life became the light of men, and the light shone into the darkness, but the darkness never overcame it. He said, though the world was created by him, the world did not recognize him. He came unto his own people, but his own people refused to receive him. Yet to as many as he, uh, to as many as who will receive him, to as many as who will believe in his name, he gives the right to be called children of God. And then he goes on to say, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the one and only Son of God, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. He says, because the law came from Moses, but grace and truth came through Christ Jesus, the one and only. And then he went on to say, now no one has ever seen God except God, the one and only, who came from the Father to reveal him to us. Now that's, a, that's an important lead-in to what we're going to talk about, because in this book, you're going to see that Paul contrasts grace and truth against the law. And that's the major theme of what we're going to get into here. So again, as a little bit of a backdrop, I'm going to sit here. Um, you remember that Paul started off as Saul. He came from a little town called Tarsus. Actually, it was quite a, quite a large town. It was a, a capital town in what's today present-day Turkey. He was born to pious Jewish parents. His father was probably a tent maker because that was the trade that Paul picked up. Uh, again, we, we have to go maybe with a little bit of assumption based upon the culture of the time, but boys were educated in the synagogue from ages five, uh, five to 15. So we assume then that Paul was probably raised up in the synagogue till he reached age 15, but he probably also showed quite an aptitude for studying scripture and understanding the law because his parents at around 15, sent him from Tarsus a long ways away to Jerusalem to study under a rabbi by the name of Gamaliel. Gamaliel was the foremost authority in the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem at the temple. The Sanhedrin, we have to think about in today's terms, is like the, uh, the Supreme Court. So he was like a Supreme Court justice. So this young man at 15 was beginning to learn under one of the foremost authorities in the Supreme Court of the land of the Jews, and he showed quite marvelous aptitude or he wouldn't have been accepted. He probably studied under Gamaliel for quite a long time, perhaps even for 15 years. Usually it took, it took quite a long while for, as we would expect, you know, someone going to, to law school to come out with a, a degree. And, uh, we believe that Paul probably not only showed real aptitude, but he was also quite an ambitious student. It's possible Paul was the same age as Jesus, probably born about the same time. And it's also conceivable that he may have been present when Jesus was brought before the Sanhedrin and charged with blasphemy and later taken before the Romans and charged with sedition against the state of Rome, claiming that he was a king, for which he was then crucified. We don't know for sure that Paul was there, but we know that Gamaliel was there. We know that the Sanhedrin was there. We know that there was quite a discussion, and it's possible Paul was there. It was possible Paul was there when they cried out, crucify him. When Pilate asked whether they wanted Jesus or Barabbas to be released. 
We're not sure. It's possible. What we do know, though, is that shortly after Jesus' crucifixion, when the disciples began preaching Jesus as the Son of God, they came against a lot of opposition by the Sanhedrin, by the high priests, by the Pharisees, because they considered that blasphemous. The disciples were brought before the Sanhedrin. Gamaliel himself even spoke out saying, ah, wait a minute, let's not persecute these guys too much just yet. You may make them martyrs. You may actually add fuel to their fire. Let's wait and see what happens. However, there was a man named Stephen, an elder, actually a deacon in the church, that spoke out, even though the, the apostles had been warned against their own lives not to be preaching this name of Jesus. He continued to. They brought him before the Sanhedrin, and he was hauled out and stoned. And what we do know for sure, because it's in the book of Acts, Paul was there. What was he doing? Collecting their robes. Here, let me hold that for you so you can wind up and throw that stone a little harder. Bring your robes here. I'll hold them for you. You go ahead. And we're told that he was there and witnessed it, and he lent his approval. This Saul also began a rampage. I mean, it said that he his rage burned against the Christian church, and they began persecuting the church to the point where the church fled out of Jerusalem, out of Judea, up into Samaria, and up into uh, Assyria to escape persecution. They began to spread, and Paul went after them. He was deputized by the Sanhedrin, and he went after them like a deputy marshal, as you can imagine, with a posse, charging after them with papers that legally allowed him to arrest people, men and women, and bring them back to Jerusalem to face imprisonment and possibly death. That was, that was Saul. We don't think of Saul that way. We think about St. Paul, but that was Saul. Sometimes there's a lot of truth in a person's name, especially as it relates to people we see in the Bible. And Saul, in his persecution of the church and chasing, chasing after them, took his posse up toward Damascus because he heard that there was a gathering up in there with the intent of bringing them back. On his way on the road to Damascus, you can read this, I think it's in Acts chapter 9, um, Saul was taken down off his high horse. There was suddenly a, a great light that shone, so much so that it blinded him, and he fell to the ground. And then he heard a voice that said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul said, well, who is it that I am persecuting? And the voice came to him, I am Jesus Christ, whom you are persecuting. He was told that he would be led in this blindness into the city, and there was a Christian that came forward by the name of Ananias that was called by God to come and minister to this young man. And he was told, he needs to learn of me and then suffer for me, for me and for my word. Three days later, after he was ministered to and uh, doctored by Ananias, his vision returned. It was like scales fell from his eyes. And with the restoration of his vision and a revelation of who Jesus is, he began to preach that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And immediately, he became the target of persecution by the Jews that he had been leading himself to persecute the church. So much so that he escaped by the skin of his teeth, by being lowered out of a basket down to the ground where he could escape to Jerusalem and there, because the rest of the disciples and the rest of the Christian church didn't trust him, he was persecuted not only by the church, but also by the Jews who were following him. And he escaped with some help back to uh, Tarsus. Now, this is where we pick up the story. Paul <clears throat> spent time, he says, and we'll read about this, but Paul spent some time away. He needed to know who Jesus was, and he was led away in the Spirit 
to a place where most of the major prophets were led, and that was into Arabia. What's in Arabia? Mount Sinai. You remember who met with God in Mount Sinai? Moses. Another. Anyone else? Elijah. Elijah. Remember, he ascended. So Paul withdrew to uh, to Arabia, and it wasn't until much later that he came back to meet again with the church. He needed to receive that revelation of who Jesus Christ was for himself. And we're going to pick up that story here. After he returned, he was joined by a man named Barnabas who befriended him and took him under his wing and essentially sort of tutored him along and brought him on his first missionary journey, which was into the region of Galatia. And this letter then is what follows after his first missionary journey into Galatia. It's been said that Paul, in his missionary journeys, walked 10,000 miles. Can you imagine that? 10,000 miles on foot. This first region wasn't to one city. You know, he writes letters to like Ephesians and Philippians. Those are all to the churches or Colossians, to the churches in one city. But this was to several churches in a region in present-day Turkey today called Galatia. It was settled by Gauls who were Celtic, Germanic people that had moved down from the north into this region. <clears throat> Paul wrote this letter because he met with some bad news. After he had gone and spent time with people planting churches in Galatia, and they had warmly received him, he heard that following behind him were the Jews who had followed behind him trying to kill him, and they were now trying to assassinate his character and his message, and him if they could catch up with him. And this is where we pick up. Chapter 1. We're going to throw up a slide here because Paul's going to start off in verse 3 of chapter 1 with what he says is the gospel. He says, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of God our Father. This is the shortest definition that Paul gives for what the gospel is. What is a gospel? It's good news. That's what the word literally literally means. This is a gospel according to uh, Charles, or what's his name? Charlie Brown. No, no, well, Charlie Brown, but Charles Schultz. Schultz. Yeah, Charles Schultz. Charles Schultz, okay? Tell me what love is, Chuck. He says, a man named Jesus. See, the gospel is God loves you. God loves you so much that he was willing to die for you rather than to live forever without you. That's the love. Like that passage we read out of, or I recited to you out of John, Jesus literally was God with skin on, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and he came from the Father to reveal him to us that we may understand. See, Jesus started his ministry by saying, the appointed time has come. He says, repent and believe the good news, for the kingdom has drawn near to you. The appointed time has come. It was a time, it was a coronation announcement. The king had come. The kingdom had come. Now when Jesus said, repent and believe the good news, we have to ask ourselves, what does that mean? What would they have thought of? Well, sometimes we think about repentance as being like being remorseful. You know, I'm really sorry for what I did. I'm really ashamed for what I did. You know, I'm embarrassed for what I did. But it's not remorse. Repentance means to change your mind. In Greek, it's melania. That means literally change your mind. And Paul, in his letter to the Colossians, wrote, Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God in whom God the Father was pleased to have his fullness dwell. In other words, Jesus came to re reveal to us the true nature of God the Father. People had been worshiping God the judge and even worshiping the law to the point where they had lost um, track of who the true nature of God is. They didn't have the word like from 1 John saying, God is love, God is spirit. 
perfect love casts off all fear. All they knew was that they were under the indictment of a cosmic judge and liable to being punished for their sins. They had to keep killing sacrificial animals every day, every day, to cover their sins. Every day the shofar, the horn of the priest, would sound from the wall of the temple, saying, now is the time. Three o'clock every afternoon, the sacrificial lamb would die to cover your sins. And it went on day after day after day after day. Drop down to, Pat, or to verse 6. He says, there's no other gospel. He goes on to say, I'm astonished that you're so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. <clears throat> I picked this, this book to, to share with you today because we had on a couple of occasions this summer the opportunity to entertain a guest at our church. It was a young man who had recently come to faith and found out that he um, was of Jewish ancestry. You know, I spoke with him quite a long time and he said, well, I, I didn't really go to church as a kid. My parents really weren't Christians. They weren't really raising me. They, they're sort of nominal Catholics now, but he said, I didn't really have a faith growing up. But I found out through blood testing that I'm at least 50% Ashkenazi Jew, that's like the, the purest of the Jewish lineage, okay? And he grabbed onto that. And he went into the scriptures and began to read about all of the Old Testament. And he, got, he became on fire. The man was passionate, I'll give him that. He was very passionate. But he came here with a lot of questions and a lot of remarks and a lot of proclamations about death and destruction that waits for us at every turn. That God is this judge that's wielding a gavel and he's ready to drop it on our head. And I asked myself, where's the good news? Like, where's the good news? He even quoted um, out of Matthew. You'll recognize something uh, from this. He said, uh, I think this is out of Matthew. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to pass on that. He quoted out of Matthew that, oh, I know, he said, uh, in the end, there will be some who will come saying, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? And the Lord will say to them, Depart from me, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evil doers, I never knew you. And he was essentially using that passage to say, Unless you follow every law, then you are under God's judgment. He wore the tassels on his shirt. He wore the, the coarse woven shirt of one fabric. He refused when he was with us to share in our potluck because <clears throat> we had pork and beans. We had stuff that was not kosher. We may have had shrimp salad. I don't know what all we had, but he refused to eat among us because of those things. Because he believed he needed to keep himself ritually pure. But what does Jesus say about the law? Well, Jesus in Matthew 5 says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law. I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill them. And in Matthew 5.20 he says, For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses, listen to this, surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teacher of the law, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Ooh, that doesn't sound good. 
And then in verse 48, he says, be, be perfect, therefore, as your Father in heaven is perfect. Yikes. How do you do that? How is that possible? Well, the rest of the story, it seems, is found in Matthew 19. You'll remember this story. A rich young man came before Jesus and said, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, Well, why do you call me good? There's only one that is good. He's testing him. Do you recognize who I really am? God is good. He says, Well, what does the scripture say? He says, Well, follow the law. He says, Well, which law? <coughs> Jesus answered, he says, well, I've kept all the laws since, since you, but, but what law in particular? Jesus said, if you want to be perfect, ready? If you want to be perfect, he says, go and sell your possessions, give the money to the poor, and then come and follow me. If you want to be perfect, follow me. If you want to be perfect, follow me. And when the man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. And Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And his disciples were astonished and said, well then, who can be saved? Here's the final solution to the problem. How do we live perfectly to the law? Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. It's only in Christ that we have any hope. If Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and we can't possibly fulfill it ourselves, then it's only in Christ that we have any hope whatsoever. Paul writes, even if we are an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we gave to you, let them be eternally accursed. Again, he says, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, Jesus is love. Let him be eternally condemned. Verse 11, I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel I preach is not something that's man-made. I didn't receive it from any man. I received it by revelation from Christ Jesus. For you heard in my previous testimony of my way in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. He expands on this a little bit more in Philippians 3. He says, if anyone thinks that he has reason to put confidence in the flesh, that is confidence in your, in your worldly accomplishments, he says, I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I was born of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, even to the point of persecuting the church. As for legalistic righteousness, faultless. Now he's not saying he was sinless. He says, as to the letter of the law, I was faultless. Then he goes on to say where he was as to the spirit of the law. He says, well, whatever was to my prophet, I now consider loss. Remember that first song we sang? For the sake of Christ, what is more, I consider everything compared to the surpassing knowledge of growing in Christ Jesus my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. It's not the law, it's faith in Christ that saves us. Verse 15, but when God who set me apart from birth and called me by his grace, grace, there's an interesting word, what does that mean? Some people use the acronym G-R-A-C-E, God's redemption at Christ's expense. Grace is an unmerited, unearned, undeserved, love of God the Father. It's unmerited. He didn't do anything to deserve it or to earn it. He says, 
by his grace, was pleased to reveal the Son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I didn't consult any man. I didn't go up to Jerusalem. I went immediately into Arabia and later returned to Damascus. How long were the, were the disciples walking with Jesus and learning from him? You remember? How long? Three years. Three years. Oh, what's this say? Verse 18. Then after three years, Paul says, I went to Jerusalem to get acquainted with the other disciples. Well, I met Peter and I met James, the brother of Jesus. Drop down to chapter 2. He says, 14 years later, that's now 17 years that he's been preaching, sharing the gospel, learning about Christ. About Christ. He says, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas, and I took Titus along. Titus was one of the people that he had picked up on his first missionary journey, a Gentile uh, Greek. And he said, I went before them with the gospel that I preached among the Gentiles. A matter arose, verse 4, because some false brothers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus, to make slaves of us, but we didn't give in to them. Verse 6, as for those who seem to be important, whatever they were makes no difference to me. These are the Pharisees that he was talking about. God does not judge by external appearance. Those men added nothing to my message. They saw that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, just as Peter had been to preach the gospel to the Jews. Now in verse 9, James and Peter and John, whose were, those were Peter to be pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, and they recognized the grace given to me, and agreed that we should go to the Gentiles. Let's drop down to verse 11. This is kind of interesting because there was an opposition that rose in the church, a division in the church. Can you imagine that? Have you ever seen a church with any kind of division before? He says, right at the right there in the first church of Antioch, potluck dinner, this is what happened. When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of them. The other Jews joined him in this hypocrisy, hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. You know that hypocrisy is the number one reason, according to Christian researchers, why people leave the church. Why people say, I'm not going to join that church. It's when we say one thing, but we do something else. So here's Peter sitting at the potluck, eating pork and beans, and, and shrimp salad and enjoying a good time and suddenly those that come in with the robes and the stoles and so forth show up and it's like, oh, I gotta back away from here. And they start dividing and the whole room separates the Gentiles from the Jews. Up to this point in time, almost all of the church was Jewish, but because of Paul's ministry, more and more Gentiles were coming into the church and they didn't know what to do with them. And there was a group of people called the Judaizers who insisted that if anyone was going to come into the church, they first had to become full-fledged, card-carrying Jews. They had to be circumcised, they had to be baptized, and they had to observe all of the laws of Moses. Verse 15, he says, We who are Jews by birth and not, quote, Gentile sinners, end quote, Know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. We too have put our faith in Christ, that we may be justified by faith and not by observing the law. Because by observing the law, no one is justified. Justified is a legal term that means declared innocent. Like a judge says, I've heard the case, case closed, you're declared innocent. It wouldn't even matter if you were guilty. If the judge said you were innocent, you were justified. So, what do we mean by this? Where are we going with this? Well, let me show you. Actually, let me just drop down here. Verse 10, first, it says, For through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live for God. 
I have been crucified with Christ, and yet I live. Nevertheless, it's not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Here's what, here's what Paul's saying. We all have a big, ugly eye. Right? It could be, if it's, a, if it's a number, it'd be number one, right? We all look out for number one, but that's also who this big, ugly eye is. Does anyone know where, what's, what the center of sin is? S-I-N, right? Anyone know what the center of pride is? D-R-I-D-E. -E. Anyone know who the author of sin is? You remember, this is a little tougher question. You remember the author of sin? Well, it's obviously not G-O-D, right? Satan. What was his name before he fell? That was his name after he fell. Lucifer. Lucifer. L-U-C-I-F-E-R. And what did, how is it that we came into sin? Well, he came into the garden, and what did he say? He said, well... You won't die if you eat of the fruit of the tree of good and, evil. good and evil, the knowledge of good and evil, right? He said, you won't die. He said, your eyes will be open, and you will be just like God. Sin, didn't, sin for humanity began in the garden, but sin didn't begin in the garden. We were enticed into it by a deceiver, right? And we were left with the burden of the big, ugly eye. See, Satan, we can read these words if you ever want to. Go to uh, Isaiah chapter 14. And you can read the words of what Lucifer said. I will ascend to the throne. I will ascend to the mountain of assembly. I will make my throne above the stars, above the clouds. I will make myself like God most high. I, 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 Right? And Jesus came to say, that's a terrible burden for you to bear. I have a place for it. You know, like, like a good host. You come into their home, what do they say? Let me take your cloak. Let me, let me hang that up for you. And that's what Jesus said. He says, I have a place for this. I have a place where you can put it. I have a place where it can hang. I have a place where it belongs. I, Paul says, have been crucified with Christ, and yet I live. In the life I live, in the flesh, I live by the faith of the one who loved me and gave himself for me. Christ came to give us a place to put that big, ugly eye that we carry around like a burden in our lives and to put it aside, to put it away. Have you ever had something that you've worked on really hard? You've put your blood, sweat, and tears into it. You've tried really hard to accomplish something and then have somebody come along behind you and just trash it. I mean, just literally trample on it. Let me show you a little clip. I don't know if you can will it show it on the screen here or not. Okay, show you a little clip here of what I mean. Stomping through, somebody put him up to it, but stomping through all the things that Paul had laid out and explained about, about grace and about love and about forgiveness and about freedom. And then these Judaizers came behind them and said, no, just walk right through all of that stuff. 
Paul's not a real disciple. He's not a real apostle. He's a Johnny come lately. His message, you know, he's leading you astray. You need to follow the law of Torah, or you can't be a full-fledged believer. And they came walking through. Did you see what the, the old man did? He just embraced the kid. He picked him up and brought him over. He didn't scream at him. He didn't rebuke him. He didn't. Paul's got some pretty hard rebuke, but it's not to the churches of Galatia. Here's what he says, though. He says, chapter 3, oh, you foolish Galatians. You, oh, what are you doing? Who bewitched you? He says, I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to attain your goals by human effort? Does God give you a Spirit and work miracles among you because you observed the law or because you believe what you heard? Martin Luther said, trying to be more right with God by acts of the law only made me less right with God. He said, this is the paradox of legalism. The more we adhere to the law, the prouder we become. The center of pride is I. The more we adhere to the law, the more we say, look at me. I'm better than this guy. I'm better than that guy. You remember the parable that Jesus shared about the Pharisee and the publican? He told his disciples there were two people that came to the temple. One a Pharisee, all dressed in his robes and finery, and one a publican or a tax collector. And the Pharisee stood off by himself and said, Thank you, O God, King of the universe, that I'm not like other men. I come to the temple every day to pray. I, I fast twice a week. I pay 10% in my tithing. I'm not like these other men. I'm not a robber, an evildoer, an adulterer, or a murderer, or like that tax collector over there. And the tax collector stood by himself with his head hanging down. He couldn't even look up to heaven, beating his chest. said, oh Lord, look upon me and have mercy, a sinner. And Jesus said, Surely that man, the tax collector, will enter into heaven before the other. He said, there will be prostitutes and tax collectors and sinners who will come in to heaven before the Pharisees. And this was something that just irritated them. He says, consider Abraham. He believed in God and was credited to it as righteousness. Understand then that those who believe are children of Abraham. He, what he's saying here is, is that Abraham, 430 years before the laws of Moses were even given, believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now see, Abraham didn't earn God's approval even by faith. It said that God gave him that righteousness. It wasn't by observing the law. It wasn't even by his faith, but it was something that God gave him. And it says, The scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announced in advance to Abraham this gospel, all nations will be blessed through you, Jew and Gentile. All who rely on, the, on observing the law are under a curse. Now, he's, this is the third time Paul's mentioned this accursedness, right? The third time. And he's speaking, again, to the Judaizers, those who demand that people follow the law, circumcision, all the dietary restrictions, in order to be right with God. I've chosen a little clip from the, from the series The Chosen that some of you are familiar with, that speaks to this, uh, those people who have been a part of that in our church, we meet on Thursday evenings, we've been watching this, you'll recognize this little clip. It's a clip that shows a little bit of an exchange between uh, two, two people. One is Nicodemus, 
who is a Pharisee and a member of the Sanhedrin, and one of his disciples, one of his students, and you can imagine the same discourse perhaps happening between uh, Gamaliel and Saul, okay? But I'm gonna show you this clip because in this clip you'll see the attitude and the heart of the Judaizers as it relates to the law and to the testimony of Jesus. He is simply a man. I don't understand it anymore. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. The man claimed to be God, and you said nothing. I will petition Jerusalem, requesting permission to search the archives for all matters pertaining to such false prophecy. Will you oppose my petition, Rabbi? The question on the mind of every man who reads my account will have to be, what did Nicodemus do? So, it's all about politics and promotion for you, isn't it? It's not to serve God. I'm sorry, teacher. It's about the law. And the law is God. And the law is God. How terrible. Where's the good news? Where's the gospel? The law is God. Did you see what they were wearing? They were wearing what's called a tallit. This is a tallit. Sometimes it's called a prayer shawl. In the, in the Christian church, it's sometimes referred to as a stole or a vestment. But in the Jewish tradition, in each of the four corners are these fringes. You remember when the woman with the bleeding issue came up behind Jesus, she touched, it says, the hem of his garment. It was probably the fringe and was healed. These are called tzitzi, T-Z-I-T-Z-I-T. -I -I and in Jewish tradition, there's a numerology to all the letters. And so the numeral evaluation of the word tzitzi is 600. And then each one of these is made up of, a, of a, a bunch of cords. There are eight cords which are bound together with five knots, which equals 13. And this is to be, for the Jews, a reminder of the 613 laws that they had to keep. How many of you here can recite the Ten Commandments? You get a gold star. <laughs> How many here how many here live by the grace of God under the blood of Christ Jesus? There, you all get you all get gold stars. How many here think that you could recite 613 laws? How many how, how many how many of you think that you could keep 613 laws of Moses today. Anybody. I dare even Scott to raise his hand. <laughs> I would dare even this young man who had visited us to raise his hand. Because when I spoke to him, he said, no, no, I, I couldn't. And then I, and I asked him, well, you know, which ones have, well, I've got tattoos, right? And the, the Bible says you shouldn't tattoo. And, and I haven't honored my mother and my father. I've dishonored them. And, I, and I, I divorced my wife and left her. I, I gave her, he literally said, a, a letter of divorce and left her. And he was going on and on. And it was like, well, what in your faith then covers those sins? And the answer is, even the most devout Jew today can't keep the 613 laws because 27 of them have to be fulfilled in the temple. And the Romans destroyed the temple 40 years after Jesus died. There is no temple. There's no, there's no sacrificial system anymore. They can't keep the letter of the law. As much as what they try, you know, with food restrictions and everything else, they can't keep the letter of the law. You remember what Jesus said? He said, Come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
This is sometimes called a yoke. Okay, and it was given by rabbis to their students that they would wear it and show that they were studying under a particular rabbi. Jesus said, take my yoke, take my yoke, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in spirit. My teaching is easy and my yoke is light. He was saying, is this too heavy? Is what the Pharisees put on you too heavy? Take it off. Come to me. One commandment I leave with you, love one another as I have loved you. By this people will know that you're my disciples. One commandment. Remember how many commandments Adam and Eve had? One. How many do we have in Jesus? One. One time a teacher of the law challenged Jesus, tried to trap him and said, Teacher, what's of all the laws, what's the most important? And Jesus said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. On these, all of the laws and the prophets hang. That's the fulfillment. It's as simple as that. Come out to me. What did he tell to the rich young ruler? You want to be perfect? Come, follow me. In Romans 8.1, Paul writes, There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has put away the law of sin and death. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Are you in Christ? Are you cloaked with Christ? I'm going to skip over here to uh, verse 20, I'm sorry, 26 of the third chapter. He talks a little bit about um, cursed is everyone who tries to maintain the law, you can't do it. He talks again about the 430 years between Abraham and the coming of the law. And then he says here, well, let me back up to verse 24. He says, what was the purpose of the law? The law was put into effect to lead us to Christ. If the law does not lead us to Christ, it has served no purpose at all. That we may be justified by faith. And then he comes down and he talks about the promise. He says, you are all sons of God through your faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you were baptized into Christ. And you have clothed yourselves in Christ. Just like Jesus took on human flesh, God himself clothed himself in humanity. We are clothed with Christ. There is therefore no Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Heirs of what? Jesus answered that question in Matthew 26. He says, And the Son of Man will come in his glory, and all the angels with him, and he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people, like a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, the sheep, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance your inheritance prepared for you from before the foundation of the earth. Well, today we talked about law, about those that were trying to pervert the gospel, about those who were demanding that Christians first become good Jews before they could become even Christian, and about Paul's response to it. Next time we meet, next Sunday, we're going to finish up with the last three chapters. And we're going to talk about freedom, because that's the real message that Paul brings. He'll say, it was for freedom that Christ came to set you free. And we're going to examine what it means to live in Christ, to be in Christ, and to be free in Christ.
I'm going to ask our praise team to come up and lead us in our closing song.
sins that are as far away as the east is from the west. We just lay it all before you on the cross. We give our hearts to you finally and just trust that you'll return our hearts to us in freedom. In Jesus' name, we have his power through the Holy Spirit. Wow. I love this church. <laughs> it's so amazing. What a privilege for a pastor to be able to sit in a church and worship and just watch the Holy Spirit move. Not only the music team, the message, AV stuff, and all of you guys. I mean, this is amazing. And just, just gosh, I love this church. You guys are wonderful. And, and I'm going to think about, too, about the ways in which I, I revert over to law, where, you know, I've got a little shemul in me, you know, <laughs> you know, going on, where, you know, I go, yeah, I live by grace, but it's just, there are places where I've got hoops to jump through, either for myself or others. So I'm going to think about that this week. I'm going to do a little reflection on that, but... Hey, Facebookers, YouTubers, thank you for joining us this morning. Thanks for your support, too, and I'm anxious to see about the freedom that Christ gives us. I mean, we don't often associate, you know, church, we think, ah, oh, obligations, I've got to give my money and do all sorts of things and all this stuff. And Jesus talks about freedom, freedom. So I'm looking forward to that next week, too. But thank you, Facebookers, for being with us. Your love and your support are there. You can... Find out more stuff on our, our, our uh, website, www.lighthousechurchdrummanisland.com. Good news, always. And, uh, and thank you for your financial support, too. We appreciate the donations and stuff. You can go right to our website. There's a giving tab, and safe and secure, and you can give anywhere between one and a million dollars. So, uh, and we appreciate it all. So God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful week.